Hey, superstars, welcome back to another episode of Word Up with Danny Katz. Today, I am joined by Jay Stevens, author of Storming Heaven, LSD and the American Dream. I was introduced to Jay by our mutual and dear friend, Robert Forte. And I was so excited to have Jay on to dive a little bit deeper into the psychedelic op that you guys know I love exploring, unpacking, and attempting to make sense of. And we also got into the origins of language. It was a fun conversation with a very, very smart, multidimensional thinker. So before we dive in, I'm reminding you to click the subscribe button as well as the notification bell, which may or may not work given how much Google fears me and all of my fun guests. Before we dive in, I'm reminding you to click that subscribe button, to like, to share, to comment, to click the notification bell so that you can be notified of my every next podcast drop, Words Are Matter drop, all the videos you will be notified as well. I'm reminding you that my show is structured in halvesies, which means the first half is free to the public on all of the audio podcast platforms, as well as on locals and YouTube. The second half is reserved for my paying supporters on locals and on Patreon. You can find the links below, choose the platform of your choice. And when you support me for as little as $5 a month, you get access to all of my second half conversations. If you're interested in tuning in to the podcast series I do with Emily Moyer, Words, that is available for my $10 and up subscribers. So just giving you a lay of the land so that you can decide which option is best for you. Keep in mind that this podcast is a true labor of love. No one is paying me. I don't have any advertisers. I don't get um, YouTube advertisement. All of those things tend to affect what those sponsoring the show think that I am allowed to say or not to say because freedom is always my priority. I am rolling with your donations. Your donations are what keeps this podcast afloat and allows me to continue to make video and podcast content for you. So if you are gleaning any value of what I am sharing here, then consider supporting me on Locals, on Patreon. If you want to offer a one-time donation, there's also a link below for that. Okay, that does it for housekeeping. Buckle up and prepare to enjoy my conversation with Mr. Jay Stevens. I have been reading your book, um, Storming yeah. Heaven. Mm -hmm. um, it's such, like well done. I was gripped from the get-go. Like, I feel like for any author, it's like pulling someone in, you know, you want people to continue, and I feel like you rocked it. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Because that's all it is, as a writer, you just want them to read the next sentence. Exactly. And if you do it well enough, they'll follow you not knowing where they're going, you know, which is, which is the trick, then you can, you know. Yeah, then so. you can take them to, weirder places that they had no idea that they were going to be traversing but we live so much today in what you might call a database give me give me the you know give it to me in a hundred words right sort of el everything is the elevator pitch okay you've got 15 seconds to explain how we save the environment then i'm moving on you know beyonce is doing something i gotta check that out but anyway so much of the information we're given is just well it's going to be done by ai you know, it's going to all, and, and then there's the creative stuff, like we're talking about, you make a sentence, so they want to read the next sentence. Right. So you know, they, they go on a journey, or, you know, you go to the Wikipedia, and here's the boom, here it is. The guts have been carved out by, you know, and it's the short form. Um, I like both, I guess, because I, you know, I'm always on Wikipedia, so why am I talking like this? <laughs> well, I it heard It sucks you in and spits you out. <laughs> I heard you say that um, AI is going to be writing for us. Do you feel like that's an inevitability? Do you feel like that's a done deal? 
I think it's already writing for us in all kinds of formats or else the people doing a lot of this jittle, just sort of chatter info data that we're, you know, sprayed with constantly are really illiterate. I'm always picking up the, you know, incredible uses that I think, yeah, machine wouldn't quite understand this is idiomatic. They've picked it up from a search. There was one today where you're saying, no, man, that's got to be a machine because a machine would not have, you know, figured out that this is actually an idiomatic phrase. So, the, you know, that was enough. You don't have to go anyway. So, yeah, I think I think Hollywood is thinking, you know, these guys that are paying themselves half a billion a year are thinking, man, we don't need any of these asshole writers anymore. And if we could get rid of the actors, you know. <laughs> I mean, so. we hear that going on, but I also, like, because I know one of the things that you and I are going to talk about today is language, right? Where language yeah. comes from, how language mm -hmm. works. And I feel like this is one of the tricks the social engineers use, is that they get those at the forefront of information gathering or truth hunting, like to pick up little pieces and then we speak about it as though these are definitive done deals when they may just be potentials or plans and i feel like it's our definitive declarations of their plans that then drives them forward and gives them life and we forget that we could just say no right 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 well we can't uh, I mean, you know, I, 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 we can't say no. Uh, I mean, I think that's what's uh, in a little sense you, storming heaven. So the 60s was a moment when the youth in particular said no, not going to Vietnam, not going to go get a normal job, not going to dress like that, not going to, you know, on and on and on, you know, not going to like farm with a tractor, I'm going to use horses. So it was like a profound no, and we can get into that. Otherwise, the ability seems to be lost, you know? Um, you Steve, mean, Steve as Berg, in like the individual ability to say no? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, even to get angry at the, at the correct targets, uh, you know, is, is always baffling when I sit in a, in a group of a number of people and, you know, it gets to be the kibitching about, you know, our everyday lives and how they suck. And the ability to, like, find the enemy is amazingly slippery. What do you think it is that, like, that differentiates those who do say no and the majority who seems to have lost that ability or to even get angry? Like, have well, they been co-opted? It's interesting. I mean, and this goes into other areas. So, you know, the most profound people saying no to sort of, you know, America as we know it are the Amish. You know, I mean, and, and some of the other was about the Hutterites. I mean, there was a whole bunch of them that that in, you know, the 1830s and 40s, looking at industrial America, you know, America moving into the industrial modern capitalistic age said no, profoundly said no. So I think it helps to have a spiritual basis. Mm -hmm. So even, you know, if you say that these are the people on the right, the fundamentalist Christians, their their faith gives them the ability to say no to a whole lot of things. Right. Yeah. But on the left, there's a there's a new age spirituality, if you will, that I think you can, you know, I mean, if you have a spiritual base, if you're a Taoist or whatever, though, that, that that's almost what you need. I don't think, you know, it can come from anywhere else than from down in the spirit of you're the person that's you know well that makes sense it makes <laughs> sense because there's like this atheism that i see coming out of the left and i i'm reticent to like divide you know our great grand unique populace into two but it seems like taking god away was a crucial part of them enacting what it is they're trying to enact now and getting people to go along with it because now we have fauci is god or the world <laughs> health organization sure. is god or elon musk is god because no one has you know the people who see, are going along with right. it don't have something bigger yeah so you know I, I i often think i mean this is a real jump we'll jump we'll make these large jumps and then circle back around so we now know that the ancient world was was absurdly painted in wild garish colors and that you know that the goddesses it was like a 20 foot tall golden blue 
you know, an emerald eyes sort of thing. And these were, you know, this was the Elon Musk of the day. I mean, if you will, I mean, except that they lasted a lot longer. But I think we've always needed the gods. You know, maybe there was a period in the 1800s with those guys or the 1700s when they didn't. You know, right. they just said, you know, otherwise those energies, as Jung would say, I mean, you can't repress them. They're going to come out somewhere else. You know, I mean, and I think that they come out in, in the, and also we have a profound media that sort of, you know, feeds off the idealization of celebrity and, and you know, this this insane world that we're involved in, you know, where I, I once gave a, a talk at the at the local church, and and my context was local knowledge and how uh, it was when it was at the moment when Tom Cruise was getting divorced, and and you know, I was saying it's really it's really a, an impoverishment in some sense that we know much more about Tom Cruise's woes and and lamentations than we do about our neighbors, you know. <laughs> which is, you know, and talking about my people who had been in the town for hundreds of years and they had all the local gossip, you know, I mean, it was, uh, so in some sense, we don't know who our neighbors are, they scare us, but we're, we know all about, though we know nothing about these people, you know, they now exist so far behind armor and publicists and, and all of that, you know, our presidents, we don't know who the hell they are. They're a performance on the screen. And somehow they seem to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars all of a sudden. I don't remember movie stars, you know, a great director being able to go out and buy himself a $300 million yacht. I mean, that suggests he has a bill, you know, a huge, well, who knows? I don't pretend to know Steven Spielberg's personal finances, but I think we sit down and say, wow, you know, the people that have money have so much money. So much money. And it's so odd to me that like in terms of structuring a culture that we place people who are paid to pretend above yeah. teachers, above people who risk their lives yeah. to keep us safe. Like, and then this actor strike, it's like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you're, mm -hmm. you're worthless. You do nothing. You pretend like this right. is not a real problem you know, get a real job. It's so odd to me because I see on social media these actors saying, you don't understand, you don't know what we go through. And I'm just like, please, I don't care. Right. right. Well, I care to the extent that it really depresses me to watch at the end of, you know, after we cross the bridge to the 20th century, the, the total destruction of the creative class by this sort of corporate hedge fund, you know, monsterocracy, sucking squid, whatever you want to call them, that have just taken over the arts. And now with, of course, AI, I think we can do away with you guys completely. But watching the writers, the music, well, the musicians started for it. We broke the musicians. Suddenly, you know, you were nothing unless you can play a gig and sell a T-shirt. Your music is now freely exchanged. Some of that is good. I mean, you know, so these are all ambivalent situations, but it broke the most lucrative creative class that we've seen in a long time. If you think I'm part of the creative class as opposed to the other ones, right? And then writers have seen, I mean, you know, in the 35 years I've done this, uh, you know, it's just going downhill. You know, yeah. every five years was like, significantly worse than the previous five. I mean, you'll never see a contract for 5,000 words, you know, and they're giving you $10,000 in expenses like you would in 1992. So at every level, the creative class has been devastated by these guys, mostly guys. There's a few women, but anyways, the, the ownership class, you know, right. and, and, um, it, that depresses me because I think we, the creative class, there must be some goddamn way we can swing together, you know. Well, I think and, that's and something about this appalling situation. But, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's been my experience of it is as a journalist and a writer and even as an, as an author writing books and, you know, the goals that I held for myself. 20 years ago as a writer and now that I know what I know and adjusting of like that's not, that world is gone those publishing yep. contracts are gone those yep. publishing houses don't work that way anymore but it's weird with the AI because I've seen 
the level of quality of writing, you know, on big screen and small devolved so rapidly in the past years. I'm like, who cares if it's AI? It's gotten so yeah, terrible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I wonder yeah. right. about the actors and the directors and the writers who were in the business before it was table terrible, but are now participating. And I'm wondering, like, how do you sleep at night? How are you signing on to these projects that are clearly propaganda psyops disguised as entertainment? I think you're a hungry shark, you know, and there's only the, the, the blood in the water, the gobbets of meat are getting smaller and smaller, unless of course you're the, that, the ones, you know, there's always the one success, you know, that's huge, that in some sense keeps you going. There's always the Taylor Swift. Well, she came up for the whatever. So, you know, within this, this, this uh, you know, soup kitchen that most of the creators live in, there are, there are a few Versailles, you know, there's enough Versailles to keep you hoping, to keep you thinking maybe the next one. But I think what the strike is sort of saying is that, no, no, they're moving quickly to dry up any of our, you know, dollars. I'm now seeing royalty checks of like 99 cents. You know, it's just like, you know, there's right. been, a, there's been a, wherever the money was, it's no longer flowing to you. Right. You know, there's none for you anymore. And I'm getting half a billion for last year's, whatever I did at Netflix or whatever. You know, mostly, you know, the, from the viewer, you're looking at and saying, this is dreadful shit. I mean, have you guys lost your ability to tell a story? I mean, the hundreds of millions of dollars are flowing out. You're taking the Lord of the Rings and you're coming back with this. Right. I mean, these are guys gone. They've all gone to screenwriting. School. I mean, you know, really? That's what astonishes me is how bad the product is. It's shocking. It's really, yeah. really shocking. And like, I'm embarrassed for everyone who is involved in what they're putting out now. But I also think it's like, we need to find a middle ground, like royalty residual days, those are gone. You yeah, know, yeah. those yeah. were the glory days. And I had my own glory days, you know, like writing for the LA Weekly and getting paid well to write about whatever I wanted. But it's like- Which was a good paper. I mean, the LA Weekly is like, you know. It was. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I, it pleased me to see that you'd written for the weekly because one of the things that came out of the psychedelic movement of the 60s, whether whatever position the black bureaucracies had in all of it, was this sudden explosion of let's make a newspaper. Kids, right. let's go out and put on a newspaper in the L.A. weekly, as it should be in L.A., was one of the greatest. Yeah. I mean, it, it, as soon as you got successful, I mean, you know, you're bought and there it goes. The underground press sort of, you know, didn't stay underground long. Right. I think it's demanding that we get scrappy and like literally everything going on right now, pull ourselves out of the established creative systems. Like I would love, you know, here where I live in Santa Fe, it's like there's such a lock on the, you know, the weekly here and the New mm -hmm. Mexico. And it's like there's there's such globalist control and i'm talking to people all the time like let's start our own weekly let's start our own paper yeah. you know the writer strike it's like make your own stuff like let's take our power out of these exactly. systems i don't that's one, another way. it's one of the things I, one of the effects i think that that lsd had back in 66 67 68 and a lot of kids it just said you can do this you don't need that shit. start your own newspaper you know, find a mimeograph in the church basement and go from there. And, you know, so it was that kind of spontaneous enthusiasm to do things that would annoy the establishment that like just rocketed through, well, adjacent to it, all of the like groups of boys, testosterone filled teenage 60s boys who put down their basketballs and picked up bass guitars. I said, well, we're going to be the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. This happened, I remember I was probably 11, 10, 11, but I remember when it happened in my little town. You know, suddenly there were all these 17 year old boys who had danced. You know, there was like four or five of them danced. That's you know? awesome. And, and people making music. And when people start making music, you know, that's another sad thing. I mean, you know, you look back at that explosion. When people start making music, you're in a powerful moment. You're in a revolutionary moment. It suddenly gushes up. You know, a Bob Dylan is singing, a Grateful Dead is coming. To you. I mean, you know, so 
I don't know if you can confect revolutionary moments like this. I mean, we sit here and we look back and we say, how did we get that Kool-Aid? You know, how do you, what's in the Kool-Aid? Right. I'm not sure it's ever been duplicated since, but you realize that if, if, you know, the, you know, the curtains pull apart, you can do a whole lot of things with group energy. Yeah. It's and, like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Jay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, so we, we'll leave it at how do you get group energy going? Well, it reminds me of, you know, the, the fear and loathing when Hunter talks about the high water mark and, and seeing it recede, right. which, you know, when I read it when I was in grad school, it like devastated me. And I think he was really onto something because we've become so inured and so comfortable. And now all of the young rebels are aligning themselves with Target and Coca Cola. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's like everything. Yeah. You know, ideas of success, it's not like it was in the 60s, like freedom, make good music, turn on. It's like mm -hmm. become a billionaire and get a, you know, a jet. Right. And, it, you know, right. it's like we can't have both. If you're going to do it yourself and be free, then we're going to forfeit being, you know, built that billionaire. Well, well, this gets us back to the, to the, to the storming heaven. I mean, and, and, you know, I, brought that book out in the height of, of sort of drug war too. When did so, you write that book? I wrote it in the late eighties, published it in 87. Okay. Um, just as Bush came in and ramped up the drug war again. So there were book chains, not borders and Barnes and Noble, but some of the other, they did, we refused to carry it because it had LSD in the title. Really? Yeah. Yeah. If I'd not had it in the title, I would have carried it, but because it was so prominent. Oh yeah. No, there was, there was such an extraordinary demonization. I mean, the Nixon's drug war existed because of LSD and maybe pot, but particularly LSD. Um, so to suddenly see it spin on a dime and move up here to 2020, 180 degrees from what it was when I published the book. Right. And it's fascinating. So it's fascinating for me who sort of, you know, immersed myself in the first episode. So, and if you think it was a CIA operation in the, in PSYOPs one, <laughs> that I think went badly off the rails and storming heaven sort of zones in on the comedy of, you know, what happens when you take the most materially, you know, uh, generation, perhaps in the history of history, the American, the baby boomers, the post-war American baby boomers and give them an experience that makes all of that, makes mockery of all of this material desire. Right. There's, that's not what it's out about. I mean, that's kind of funny. So Storming Heaven is really a lot about the unintended humor of PsyOps 1. It, you know, I had, you know, the contingencies, the shit that happens, you never are very good. So now we're perhaps in PsyOps 2. And you probably know more about it or have looked more deeply than I have, but it's, it's kind of fascinating the way it's going. And you how, know, in would terms you, of the how would you course. describe PSYOP 2? Well, you could describe it better, but I see, oh, the total corporate interest. I mean, there's many resonances with PSYOPs 1. You know, the Ampex, Silicon Valley, Myron Stolaroff, you know, Stanford Research is part of it. That's very similar to the energy I see around Johns Hopkins and all of that stuff. Um, 10,000 you know, people went to, uh, I'm blanking on his name, Rick, Rick. I knew Rick before Rick was Rick. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, Bob knows him even better. Uh, but 10,000 people went out there, 10,000 therapists. Uh, my wife happens to be a therapist, so she gets things every couple of days about join our psychedelic therapy program. And this is for a drug that's still not legal. Right. So when this is coming top down, this isn't like, you know, therapist saying, hey, we want to learn about this. Right. It's coming top down. Right. You know, so when you think about it, these are things that don't this isn't a bubbled up from the people. This is coming top down from some energy. And uh, if you think about Leary's great insight that, and, you know, and that other people wasn't originated with him, but it's your, your mindset, what you think is going to happen. And your setting that reinforces that, you 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 have a profound, interesting situation of what's going to be the protocol for all these therapies. They're they're basically designing a, a gener you know generation of therapists to implement you know a protocol 
this isn't the 60s where everyone freaked freely, right? right? This is the opposite, right? Right. <laughs> the that you're having now. So that all that stuff interests me, uh, very interesting. I'm remixing Storming Heaven, making it about one and a half times as long. And I will go into this, what my, what my thoughts are, you know, in, in a, at the end of it is with, you know, PSYOPs too, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, interestingly with psychedelics, they do the high school year drug test where they give all the high school seniors and they ask them, you know, what drugs have you done the past year? And this is the basis of all of the sort of drug knowledge at the center of the war is this great little diagnostic they hand out to high school kids, which you got to assume who wouldn't lie like crazy. Right. right. But that, that, that never occurs to them that this data may be garbage. But anyway, however good it is, however hard the data actually is, about 11% of high school seniors from 19, whenever they began giving it like 72, take out, take psychedelic. It has a consistent, I mean, now it's sort of ballooned, but for years there was a consistent 10% of kids coming up that said, yeah, I'll do this. So I don't know what that means. I mean, I think of it like the Octavio Paz, the great Mexican poet said, 6% of people are, are born with the poet gene or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. you know, in, in every culture. There's just for no reason at all, they seem to be born to want to do this shit with language. So okay. I don't know how hard his figure is, but it's always intrigued me that, you know, he said, I think it's 6%, you know, mm -hmm. based on like his little town. There were 10 of us, you know. Anyway, so what the government will do or what this sort of psychedelic science is being sort of erected here, um, you know, uh, and all the people that are looking for new stuff that are doing legally with children, you know, very surreptitiously. It, they're all out front, hedge funds funding them. It's a, you know, it's a crazy world compared to when I was doing the research for Storming Heaven. And these people were way underground, just were barely releasing ecstasy to see what would happen. Yeah. What is your take on the shift from psychedelics being something that we experimented with on our own in more casual settings to this, like, there's a prescription and there's an authority figure and this whole setup? You're going to have, you're going to have a very structured trip. I mean, you're not going to have the randomness, craziness, you know, uh, all that stuff. I mean, this is not about the individual. This is about, I think, bringing the individual into line with, you know, there's a big, as I said, in the, in the new version, the big clang of yang. I mean, everybody's trip is individual. This is a very singular thing when you take, you know, a psychedelic and, and remove whatever you're doing in your body and it's your consciousness. But there's a giant, what I said, clang of yang. There's this big, we're, we're now bonded, you and me, because, and you saw this in the early days in the 50s. I mean, it was just a sense, your, your experience too. And that became like a little, you know, Masonic ring, you know, I've experienced, yeah, wow. You know, and then a whole different conversation and, and you know, thing would happen. So all of that is being taken away. Um, now they tried this in the 60s. Leary had this very, you know, he had this whole thing, maybe 61, 62, his whole, we should have like Howard Johnson's, I don't know if you remember Howard Johnson's, the what? restaurant chain. Well, it could be any chain, but the idea is like you check in, you know, you got this big Chinese menu of consciousness, you know, and you want to do this one and this one. I want to lift those imprints. See, we talk about your imprints, right? That's an important thing for what we're talking, imprints, right? Because you can put him in the... Well, Leary has a whole lot. I haven't read his thing about him lifting your imprints, right? Okay. Now, you might say that... that the people that might be, you know, organizing living are not really interested in lifting your imprints. They're interested in imposing them, which can happen too. Um, you know, you could give any parameters. John Lilly's the guy to read on this. You know, set these wacky parameters for a trip, and they it happens. You know, I mean, within as he said, you can't kill the body, you can't do this, but you can make yourself the mind believe almost anything. So, you know. Cynical me says, well, Jesus, that's probably where they're going. You know, um, the Aldous Huxley aura is probably too strong 
And so these guys are totally, you know, let's do Soma for the masses. I mean, otherwise they're just, you know, getting in the way. I don't like to see them as I drive to my restaurant, you know, so. It definitely feels very brave new world. And I saw this when like the microdosing conversation started mm. to get louder and then all sorts of like, you know, straight, straight laced people were like, I want to get into microdosing. And it was interesting how the word was microdosing. It wasn't about the medicine or the spirit and the effects of that particular intoxicant. Right. It was about microdosing. And I was like, what do you want to microdose? Aspartame? Like yeah. cashmere? You know, like that's a that's a verb that has nothing to do with an actual psychedelic or an entheogen. It just seemed right. like it was a cool thing for people to say they were doing. It always baffled me. I mean, except as sort of maybe a, 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 a way to shoot amphetamine into your day, a kind of amphetamine. I'm in my cubicle, but I'm microdosing and I'm mixed extremely creative right at the moment. The point in the 60s was to take 250, 300 micrograms, three times the microdosing dose, and, and you know, in some sense, shred your ego, shred all that, all, you know, that reducing valve. You, of course, you can't work. What an absurd idea. As a matter of fact, back then, the idea that you might want to now go to work and be productive would have elicited laughter not that you might not go off and spend six hours designing a 15 volume interlocking sci-fi mm -hmm. you know whatever septology i don't know what the word 15 those things happened all the time so again it comes down to an interesting uh, thing about desire desire is very hot right now with the, the you know theorist gerard so there's a lot of Peter Thiel is a big Girardian and like, how do you manipulate desire? Um, when you're doing LSD on your own and, and you know, you got your own protocol of going, you know, even if it's hanging out with your girlfriend or your friends and you're going to walk in nature, you know, you're projecting your desire, you know, okay. And it's going to have a big, big payoff. But in these other things, we're talking about them basically projecting their desires, their things into your, you know, guided trip. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I'm terrified. When I first heard that they were legalizing, decriminalizing, I just thought this is the worst possible thing. And I also see, you know, which we especially saw in the past three years, how so many people want to defer to authority and want these so-called authorities to render their world safe. And I think of like, yeah. you know, very high dose psychedelic trips where part of my character development was figuring out how to deal with the terror, how to deal with the discomfort. If someone was there to handle it for me, I would have lost a tremendous opportunity to empower myself and know myself better. So this sounds like a, a really wretched idea to me. <laughs> well, I, it, it's not original with me. It's, it's Terrence McKenna, you know, said it, you know, he said it to me, I, you know, there are no casual trips. Right. You know, you got to understand that you're in this realm. There are no casual trips. If that's what you're looking for, don't you know, <laughs> don't drink this ayahuasca, baby. <laughs> um, you know, yeah. And so the whole spiritual part of it, I mean, you know, is not there at this time. That right. was the profound thing the first time. These are kids that have been raised without any really spirituality, as opposed to religiosity. A lot of them probably went to church and all that stuff, but no spirit. So they had a huge spiritual hunger. And as soon as you like, you know, deconditioned them, you yeah. know, Stan Groff used to say, that's ah, just a decondition. You want the one, you know, want the elevator thing? It's a deconditioning agent. It'll decondition you. Whatever your conditioning is, it's now going to get lifted. For a while and leary would say you could re-imprint yourself with better condition lift it re-imprint um so i've lost my train there <laughs> what is your take on like the, the increasing the popularity of ayahuasca over the past 20 years and like how that kind of took off? you know um very fascinating i i think the the ayahuasca is coming up um, of course, it was legal, um, and it is a profound experience. Um, and 
I, you know, I can remember how dumbfounded I live in Vermont, so it's pretty rural. And I remember in the towns don't get bigger than, except for the one town, Burlington, don't get bigger than 15,000 people. Mm -hmm. So I remember how dumbfounded I was when a little town of about 15,000 up there, somebody said, hey, you know, there's all these Iowascaro is going to be that, you know, the days in, you know, in the rec room, doing a session. And I thought, what? <laughs> what? You know, so now there are professional organizations that handle it that, you know, you can pay them 3000 and, and go over there. But, you know, 20 years ago, the Iowa Scarlet started coming around and they were in the most astonishing venues um, practicing their thing. This, this can spin us into something. I mean, get out of the psychedelics, um, you know. So how do you do, you know, how did the shamanic ancestors discover, you know, the, the DMT and the ayahuasca and I, I'm blanking on the potentiating agent, right? The other plant that you need, you know, I mean, how, how this was constructed in a pre-scientific world is something that fascinates me. How, well, we know what happened. I mean, shamans go into a shamanic trance, their power animal. Yes. I mean, whatever it is, direct them to all this interesting information that they're in some sense given. Um, and so that's it gets us into a fascinating thing. Okay, so could this all just be, uh, and I go into this in the remix of Stony Heaven, you know, uh, an operation by the plant powers. I mean, ergo was, you know, it's not the first time LSD in the 60s or now the aughts that Western Civ has dealt with an ergo based culty revival. So, you know, perhaps the plant powers are playing a, a, a part here and, and you know, the orcas, you know, deruttering the boats off the coast of Spain. It's just the late iteration of what plants have been attempting to do for millennia. Yeah, and it has me wondering, like, what's operating through the plants? Because I know so many people, and this has happened to me, like, you know, I have a very good relationship with ayahuasca. And when I've sat with her, she'll try to convince me to, like, take her on as my mission and, like, I know so many people, I have to go to the Amazon, I have to start a school, and I'm yeah. like, she's trying to control you. She doesn't care about your dharma. She wants you to accomplish her mission. And then it's okay. like, well, who's behind that mission? You know, is this the plant's world? Is Are they extra dimensional? What's... Yeah, perhaps they're all cats, you know, in the way the cat totally trains you as opposed to the dog to like what the cat, you realize you become an extension. And so the plants too, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, it's, it's, you know, the machine elves, I mean, you know, they tell you all kinds of things. Can you trust any of it? That becomes the big, the big thing. And it can, you know, blow your mind. You go too deeply into, into any of these things. Well, and how, how willingly we give our power away that if a, a message comes through a plant during a ceremony, we decide it's true. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I've been watching Aubrey Marcus with his like propping up of RFK and he sees these prophecies in his medicine journeys. And it's like, maybe that's just the delusion of your yeah. mind. Well, yeah. So, you know, the, the, the Society for Psychical Research sprang up in, well, in all the European countries, but England, America, and William James ran it here in America. And I was just reading, sometime I downloaded the proceedings, right? And they had this totally boring woman named Mrs. Piper that they could never prove she was a fake. And they were in some sense there to prove, to find the real ones by proving the frauds, frauds. So. Okay. And she was a totally boring, uninteresting woman that seemed to know all kinds of shit. And when she was in that state, had profound psychological insight and seemed to be operating from a totally different mind. Because right. they have just all these, all these, you know, in, you know, her talking. And you said, who the hell is this? Because it's not, you know, and that's what they all said. They said, here's this like totally boring woman. But she seems to have no shit. She knows stuff all about your past. She packages it in a wonderful psychological thing. So. James and his boys could never break her. And uh, I don't know. It's all very bizarre to me. I went to, uh, years ago, which when I was a journalist, I went to uh, cover one of the, the early channelers, you know, the 10,000-year-old warrior, whatever. And uh, 
the woman that was channeling it was this small little woman and, and then suddenly she you know and she was mingling you know sort of drinking the cocktail everyone was drinking cocktails and stuff before and then she went and did her thing and it's like you know booming arnold schwarzenegger voice came out of her little body and people lined up and i remember the guys right in front of me that you could ask one question one or two questions. So they humbly sort of after she made her little rap about the general situation of the times, right? Everybody went up and asked the question. And this couple in front of me said, did we know each other in a, in a different life? And she said, yes, you did. You were the girl in, in, in the thing you were like, you know, your father had a stable. And she turned to the other guy and said, you were the village idiot. And she was, she was nice to you. She was the only one in the village who was nice to you. So I come up and I, you know, I, I'm trying to think of something. So I, when am I most creative? And this girl she go, when you change your shoes. And that was my answer. So it was, it was a totally bizarre, interesting, how do you fucking explain? You know, again, it was the same thing. This was sort of not a very interesting person. She seemed to go into a, you know, a theatrical transformation and, and gave really interesting, amusing stop for about 40 minutes 50 minutes you know she performed you know pretty good so you know did it resonate with you when she said when you're changing your shoes yeah it kind of did but well, that's private okay. <laughs> i okay. talk about my feet with yeah. anyone no it did it actually didn't i thought oh god she's right at some level but what does that mean i may go to my grave now pondering this strange person stay with it when you change your shoes yeah I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I know experientially profound wisdom absolutely can come through um, various substances and journeys. And at the same time, like it's still being filtered through our minds. So it goes back to how well are we on to ourselves and our defense mechanisms or our strategies and also just seeing how I think one of the primary issues plaguing our culture is this need for an authority figure, an external authority to tell us something. And so mm -hmm. even on a solo medicine journey, you know, it's going to be on me to decipher, wait a minute, is this just my ego getting in the way? And do I need to get around this? But if we have some authority there as seems to be um, mm -hmm. sure. Being prescribed by what's coming through the, you know, psychotherapy right. community, then again, we're going to get further and further away from really knowing ourselves and mastering ourselves. Right, right. So yeah, what we talked about earlier, you know, a lot of people scared of taking psychedelics. There's the ten percent in the in the everything they're saying, bring it on. I'm excited right. about this, you know. And and then there's the ninety percent of which probably another thirty percent would love to do it, but are too scared. And same probably the numbers back in the '60s. Right. I'd love to do that. And so now you've handed them a, a way to do that. But why would you do that? I mean, what's in it? You know, he, who profits? We want to. Who's exactly. going to profit from the fact that suddenly thirty percent of the people are going to get this experience? It's been demonized since, you know, 1967 since it first exploded into national consciousness, why have they suddenly decided, no, this is a good thing now? And all of you sort of workers, sort of you're, you're the, the fat middle class, that you know, you've got your college degree, come and do it, um, you know, and we'll patch you up. I mean, I don't know how many people come to me wanting DMT, you know, having heard someone thinking, this is all I need, you know? You know, and say, well, no, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff. No, no, I just want the 30 minutes. I heard it last 30 minutes and then I'm a different person. Right. And so many people want, in some sense, want that, want to be a different person, just want to like shed, get away from this, this daily, you know. So, yeah. Uh, look, I get it. I, I want to be a different person, you know, like I've, I've been, ha I have those moments and I'm just, you know, had one this weekend where I'm like, I'm still this, but there's no <laughs> trick. Like, even with a big, you know, okay, okay. Let's talk about when, you say, when you say I'm still this, um, what do you mean? Let's look in the chair here. Patterns, reactions. Yeah. Traumas. And I could have a big medicine journey that's going to illuminate, might even transmute the charge, but I'm still going to need to do the hard yeah. integration work after. Yeah. 
you know, oh, yeah. not as sexy as like having a shaman give me a cup of ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, there's all the profound stuff after. Um, I remember there was a study that was done in the early 60s. They, they really wanted to know what this drug was doing. I write about it in Storming Heaven. Um, and they found, you know, they went out and found some Mormon kids that were so far from all of the, the set and setting, you know, the, yeah. they, they'd never heard of Tim Leary. They never, you know, they had no idea what was going to happen. They gave it to them and they discovered, and then they ran them for about a year through all of these personality tests and yeah, all of that stuff to see what was really going on. And they discovered that for about what immediately changed everything, even though they thought they'd had an extraordinarily profound experience, they were pretty much the same person in all kinds of, you know, parameters that they were studying, but not the ways to live. You know, that was way off the map. It was a profound change in how do I want to live, you know, um, where you might have said money's important to me and I want to have a job where I'm recognized or, you know, what? No, I may want to, you know, make candles and sell things. So you could see it was making hippies. Yep. You know, even out of Mormon kids, there was a tendency to make what later became known as the hippie. Right. So that's faded after about six months. One trip, about six months you know, you were no longer having those ideas. So I think you know, for PSYOPs, one, this was all profound, useful data. Mm -hmm. And then there's been like this 30, 30 year interregnum. Well, I don't know what kind of cogitation has gone on in those parts, if it's gone on. But well, I mean, I think it has. <laughs> um, not perhaps as much as Bob, but I think, you know, so. I think it's the Aldous Huxley, uh, you know, I put my money on the Huxley model um, and, and read Island again. You know, Huxley wrote Brave New World in 31 or 30, yeah, 31. And he hated the book. You know, it was it was it was, a, a you know, a, an albatross around his neck from the moment he completed it. And it was, you know, he did not write easily. And this was something that flew into his head. He wrote it really quickly, quicker than any of his other books. And as soon as he finished, he said, I must write the antidote. And this was a labor that he put off and put off for the rest of his life, finishing Island, which was his antidote to the Bright New World. And I haven't read it for a long time. I should now that we're having this conversation. But the Brave New World, you know, model is being implemented. Um, you know, he finished it right before he died. It was like he finished it, boom, he's dead of throat cancer. So it's always fascinated me that he had the antidote. He really felt, I must write the antidote, I must write the antidote, and spent, you know, the rest of his life not writing it until he, you know, did. So.